right stuff. But there's another side to Cooper's lifetime in aviation. One that for years he would only discuss with close friends, until now. It involves his personal encounters with UFOs. For him, it began in 1951 while flying in Europe for the U.S. Air Force. There, Cooper and other pilots witnessed an incident that has never been officially explained. A vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. Recently, Yolanda Gaskin spoke with Gordon Cooper. In this exclusive interview, Colonel Cooper spoke for the first time on television about his encounters with UFOs. I read about this incident you had in 1951, and you said you saw literally hundreds of unidentifiable flying objects. Yes, they were flying quite high. How high, we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller craft still well above what we could get to. For a day and a half, all of this happened. But then no one wanted to talk about it. Well, we sent a report forward on it, and, and the answer that finally came back months later was they were probably high-flying seed pods, which didn't sound very logical. There are always a lot of excuses. There's always um, the weather balloons. I've heard that one before. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1951, you couldn't even get close to That's the right. things that were flying overhead. You or anyone else that was flying. They were faster, higher. Six years later, Cooper again encountered a UFO. This one definitely was not a weather balloon. While supervising flight testing in Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it, filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in the wheel wells, tipped up, and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film. And then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this, and, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane. And... Uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. But if you're going to be going in and out of atmospheres like Earth or other places might have, you certainly need a little more aerodynamic type of vehicle. And the saucer has the capability of going through the air at tremendous rates of speed and handling the bow and trailing wave without making shock waves. So it can be very silent while traveling at big rates of speed through the atmosphere. But sightings of UFOs weren't limited to the military. Cooper has commercial airline colleagues who've also seen UFOs. He has a friend of mine who's a captain on a major airline. Uh, at night, was flying along, noticed this. Suddenly a big glow came off his left wing. And and he looked out and his big saucer was sitting right off their wing. And so he turned slightly toward and it moved away and turned back and it moved back in position and turned to his co-pilot and said, uh, do you see what I see? And he said, oh God, yeah, I do. And it trailed along with him for quite a period of time and tipped up and climbed very steeply away. It was on Jim McDevitt's Gemini 7 mission where they saw um, this glint of something metallic off in the distance. And he reported, and nobody had it listed on the ground, so he tried getting a picture of it, but the sun, unfortunately, was glinting off of it. So right all you got is just a glint. There was no detail on what it was, but never any, uh, any further sighting at all on it. Years later, Cooper approached the United Nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the UFO phenomenon. Right now, tell me about the letter to the UN. Well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. 
Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Very possibly, right. Like it is. Four major conclusions after 38 years of study and investigation. First, that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some, underline the some 27 times, some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Most are not. Most isotopes aren't fissionable either. I don't care about those. Second, the subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate. By that I mean that some few people in the governments of the United States, France, England, Canada, Germany, have undoubtedly known since July 1947, and I haven't talked about the second crash west of there, or how I got involved in this in the first place. Uh, a few people within the governments have known that the planet has been visited. You don't keep secrets by telling everybody. The need to know concept is paramount. Third, none of the arguments made against conclusions one and two by the debunkers of the world, including my University of Chicago classmate Carl Sagan, stand up under careful scrutiny. Their arguments sound very good until you check them against the evidence and then they collapse. And finally, fourth, this is the biggest story of the millennium. This is to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, the bodies and the wreckage, for almost 49 years. Why are you interested? And who are you to know so many things about that and to look like as if you believe all this story? Means you believe it. Well, okay. I spent 14 years in industry working on canceled government-sponsored research and development programs, nuclear airplanes, fission rockets, fusion nuclear rockets, nuclear power plants for space. I worked for major corporations, General Electric, Westinghouse, General Motors, TRW, Aerojet General. I have been, right from the start, interested in far out technology, advanced technology, space travel, things like that. And I've worked on programs that, like we operated nuclear rockets this big at a power level of 4,000 megawatts. We operated aircraft engines on nuclear power. And about 1961, at the University of California Library in Berkeley, huge library, I ran across a privately published version of Project Blue Book Special Report Number 14, the largest official scientific study ever done for the United States Air Force Project Blue Book. They had data on 3,200 sightings investigated by professional people spending full time, categorizations, quality evaluations, Charts, tables, graphs, maps, 240 of them. I was in data heaven because data is my ball game. I like taking lots of information, making sense out of it. These are two released CIA UFO documents. You can read uh, eight words there, nine words here. Totally useless words, info, location, date, things like that. Now, there are two further points. Anybody who says that agencies of the United States government are not withholding information about flying saucers are either lying or ignorant or both. I have been challenging some of the debunkers to get any of the NSA documents, 156, they say so. And it's been 10 years. Not one so far. Or the CIA documents, the rest of them. Now, some people say, look, 14 documents over a lot of years, obviously it wasn't very important. That's not true. I talked to the man who forced the CIA to release its information about mind control experiments. Illegal use of drugs like LSD and not telling the people and not with permission, nasty stuff. His first release from the government was 400 pages. He was a lawyer in Washington, so he could go back to court easily. He threatened them. I'm going to go back to court. I know there must be more. There's internal. We'll look again. They found another 400 pages. And he made more noise. They found another box and another box and another box. To make a long story short, he wound up getting 40,000 pages. The first release was 
one percent of what he eventually got, and I have it on good authority, he still didn't get it all. So what we're dealing with here is a clear situation where agencies of the United States government are absolutely withholding information. And as a matter of fact, an agency of the United States Air Force, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, wrote a memo about me saying we have reason to believe that all of our units, some or all of our units, and there are over 120 units of the OSI, would be receiving a Freedom of Information Act request from Stanton Friedman, they gave my address, concerning UFOs. If such a request is received, do not repeat, do not respond as required by Air Force Regulation 12-30 Instead, respond as follows. All such requests must be submitted to the major main office of the OSI. Now, if you get the regulation, what they're supposed to do when they get a request is find the information, send it to headquarters for review, and notify the requestor that they have found the information, thus revealing the existence of the information. What they were telling their units to do is don't tell them anything other than to talk to us, and we can tell them anything we want. Now, if there is nothing to cover up, why do you tell your people to violate their own regulations? I worked on classified programs for 14 years. I will absolutely guarantee you that secrets can be kept. I helped keep some. Furthermore, I've been to 15 archives, all kinds, in the United States and one in Canada. I have never yet seen special compartmented information. That's this extra word after the top secret. Ultra, umbra, magic, whatever. Does that mean there isn't any such material? No, I asked at the Eisenhower Library, do you have any special compartmented information? Yes. This is in person, so we couldn't lie very easily. Uh, how much do you have? About a drawer full, file drawer full. Can you search it for certain terms, magic, MJ-12, things like that. No, it would violate security. So, unless one has access to the special compartmented information, one will not get to the secrets. And despite all my looking, I have never seen any such material except that affidavit, and we don't even know what the word is after it. So, are secrets being kept? Absolutely. Yes, I can, with pleasure. I've done it more than once before. I know a good bit about the Bent Waters incident, and I've read uh, half a dozen books. I've interviewed a number of the people who took part in it. And what I have decided, after careful thought, and I have said it in public more than once before, there are only two explanations for what happened that night in Suffolk. The first is that what the people concerned, including Colonel Holt, who was at the time the deputy commander of the base, and a lot of his soldiers, or airmen, they claim that something from outside the Earth's atmosphere landed at their Air Force base. They went and uh, stood by it, they inspected it, they photographed it. The following day they took tests on the weather ground where it had been and found radioactive traces. They reported this. Colonel Holt wrote a memorandum which was sent to our Ministry of Defense. He has appeared on British television at least once to my knowledge, possibly more often, in which he has repeated effectively what he said in that memorandum. And what he said is what I have just described. That is one explanation that it actually happened as Colonel Holt reported. The other explanation is that it didn't. And in that case, one is bound to assume that Colonel Holt and all his men were hallucinating. My position is perfectly clear. Either of those explanations is of the utmost defense interest. It has been reported and claimed, and I myself have raised it with ministers at the defense ministry in this country, who deny that anything they have been informed is of defense interest. Surely, to any sensible person, either of those explanations must be 
cannot fail to be of defense interest, that the colonel of a, an American Air Force base in Suffolk and his merry men are hallucinating when there are nuclear-armed aircraft on the base must be of defense interest. If indeed what he says took place did take place, and why on earth should he make it up, then surely the entry of a vehicle from outer space, certainly not man-made, to a defense base in this country also cannot fail to be of defense interest. And it simply isn't any good ministers, and the Ministry of Defense in particular, saying that nothing that took place that December night in Suffolk is of defense interest. It simply isn't true. B uh, because I've become uh, interested in uh, def uh, UFO matters. I'm sorry, I'll start that again. Since my name has become connected with UFO matters in quite a big way in this country, and in one or two other countries too, I have frequently been asked why a person of my background, a former chief of the defense staff, a former chairman of the NATO military committee, why I think there is a cover-up or what the reasons may be for governments wishing to cover up the facts about UFOs. And a number of explanations have often been put forward, of which the most frequent and perhaps the most plausible is that the governments concerned, which are primarily that of the United States and that of my own country, believe that if they told the truth, which is that there are objects in our atmosphere, which are technically miles in advance of anything that we can deploy, that we have no means of stopping them coming here, and that we have no defense against them should they be hostile, that I believe... Sorry, I have to stop. Uh, I'll go straight on. That. I believe is because governments fear that if they did disclose those facts, people would panic. People would rush about, jam the switchboard like they did on that famous day in New York when there was a spoof, Martians have landed. People would go mad and they'll jump up and down. I don't believe that at all. I've said so in print. I've said it in the foreword I wrote to one of Timothy Good's books. I do not believe that people today in the 21st century are going to panic at that sort of information. After all, they have put up with the introduction of nuclear weapons, the destruction of two Japanese cities 50 years ago. They put up, not put up with, it's the wrong word, they take as a matter of course that we can land vehicles on Mars. They land to the precise instant forecast years before vehicles on distant planets. Why should they panic? They're much more interested in, in this country in doing the pools or the lottery. They shrug their shoulders and take it as a matter of course. Anyway, they don't trust politicians, in my experience. So I believe that that is the most likely explanation. There are, of course, others, but I, I think I'll have to settle for that. Um, if I can ask you in one closing... What I'd like to say is that there is a serious possibility that we are being visited and have been visited for many years by people from outer space, from other civilizations, that it behoves us, in case some of these people in the future or now should turn hostile, to find out who they are, where they come from, and what they want. This should be the subject of rigorous scientific investigation and not the subject of rubbishing by tabloid newspapers. Wonderful. Yes, can we have the event water space again? Because Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're ready. Um, on the Bentwaters incident, if, if you wouldn't mind... Uh it seems to me that the Bentwaters incident is a classic case where an apparent intrusion into our airspace and indeed a landing in our country was witnessed by serious-minded people in the military, responsible people doing a responsible job. And Bentwaters is, in a sense, a benchmark for how not to deal with these matters in the future.
you believe in life on other planets? Uh, oh, yes. There's not much question at all. But there's life throughout the universe. We're not alone in the universe at all. You're convinced that we're not alone in the universe? Oh, I know for sure we're not alone in the universe. Now, have we been able to identify for sure where the other planets are? No, we have not. Certainly not in our solar system. But uh, they've identified quite a number of planets now that very likely could be life-bearing planets. And uh, I happen to be privileged enough to have uh, been in on the fact that we have been visited on this planet. And the UFO phenomenon is real, although it's been covered up by our governments for quite a long time. <laughs> Whoa! Hang and, on a minute. Well, this is big. Uh, so, I, 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 I'm, whoa, this, this is, this, all of this is quite a shock to me. Well, I'm sorry, you haven't been reading the papers recently. It's starting to open up quite a bit. So you're telling me, <laughs> well, there's a lot of information to take on board. Hang on a minute. Um, I, I mean, listen, I've, I've heard, like, uh, you know, crazy UFO nuts tell me this kind of thing before. I've never had Dr. Ed Mitchell, uh, uh, you know, the, the sixth man to walk on the moon, uh, a respected scientist in his own right, uh, announced to me that, that we've been visited by aliens from uh, other planets and that they, they definitely are out there. There's no debating it. Well, that's the first time you've ever talked to me or I've told you about it before. <laughs> so, so you, you believe in all of... You believe the, the whole, the well, whole no, deal? There, there's more nonsense out there about this than there is real, uh, real knowledge. But there is... It is a real phenomenon. And uh, there's... Quite a few of us, are, it's been well covered up by all of our governments uh, for the last 60 years or so. Uh, but slowly it leaks out, and some of us are privileged to have been briefed on some of it. I happen to have grown up in the, you, I don't even know you, whether you know this place, Roswell, New Mexico, where presumably the Roswell incident of 1947 took place. And uh, I'm quite knowledgeable of the lore there, and uh, since I grew up there. But I've also been in military circles and intelligence circles that knows beneath the surface of what has been uh, public knowledge that, yes, we have been visited. So, you, and, and be serious, you're not going to go, you know, oh, I was just pulling your leg about that, that's not true. Hey, is, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if I'm, I, I've stumbled upon astronaut humour and in a couple of minutes you're going to go, I was only pulling your leg. No, I won't, won't do that. Wow. So, wow. So what? So, I mean, so you've been briefed on on uh, on the fact that that there are we've been visited. Well, I have briefed it one word for it. I, I have been involved in in uh, uh, much of this work. Uh, no, it's not my main work. It's not my main interest. But I have been deeply involved in certain committees and certain research programs with very credible scientists and very uh, intelligent people that uh, do know the real inside story, and I'm, I am not uh, hesitant to talk about it. What is the real inside story? Well, I've just been telling you, we have been visited. Are they, I mean, are we in regular contact, or was it a one-off crash, or...? Well, no, there's been quite a few, there's quite a bit of contact going on. I can't tell you because I don't know all the extent of it. I don't know all the inside details, because that isn't my really main interest. But the fact that we have been visited, the Roswell crash was real, and a uh, number of other contacts have been real and ongoing, uh, is pretty well known to for, for, for those of us who have um, been briefed and have been close to the subject matter. So why is it being covered up then? It, it, why is it that it's not mainstream? Well, that, the reason for that goes back to the, the main instance really started taking place after World War II when in the United States, at least, I can't speak for the European government or the South American governments, all of whom have recently started opening their files. And uh, most, I mean, it's been open, this is starting to open up and just read the internet or look at, look at some of the press, international press, you'll get start to get the stories that are coming out now. But, but um, I've, I've, I've had people on the show telling me that, we're ma that, that the governments are mounting up towards disclosure, to, towards saying that this is the case. Do you think it will be the case that there will be an actual disclosure on this, maybe this year, the, that the governments will come out? Be, I don't know whether it will be this year in the United States, but certainly 
We've already had it in the last few years from the Belgian government, the French government, the uh, Brazilian government, the Mexican government. They've opened their files and admitted that they had the files. Um, I like it's right. Okay, let me get my head together. Okay, listen. Here's what I know. I've I've had uh, people on the show talking about the fact that the Catholic Church has said belief in life on other planets uh, doesn't compromise your Catholicism. Of course, that just happened recently. Yeah. Uh, in association with a major release, I believe, of the British government, some of the British government files. They weren't their deepest files, but there were some files released. Yeah. Uh, what's happening is at the moment, over the next four years, all of the UFO files here in the UK are being released. Uh, do you think it's the case that we are ramping up towards maybe the UK admitting? Well, I can't say how fast it's going to happen, but certainly the public awareness of it uh, is increasing. The public acceptance is increasing. The amount of uh, misinformation and uh, covert and ab attempts to cover up seem to be decreasing. It's, uh, I, I think we're headed toward real disclosure and some very serious organizations uh, moving in that direction. What do you, You've had a long time to think about this. What do you think the impact will be on the world when it is finally mainstream news that there are alien beings that live outside this planet? Well, I think uh, at this point it's probably ho-hum, so what's new? I think that uh, certainly in the United States, there's well over 70% of the people now accept this as fact, although they may not, they do not know the, um, all the correct story. They do know that there has been, uh, or accept the fact that there has been visitation and that there's UFOs in the skies all the time that are very likely alien craft. Now, not all of them are. I suspect some of them are homegrown. I suspect that in the last 60 years or so, that there has been some uh, back engineering and the creation of this type of equipment, but it's not nearly as sophisticated as, yet as uh, what the apparent visitors have. So, as part of this, uh, I mean, as part of you knowing about this, and, and also going public with it, are you worried for your own safety with this kind of stuff, or, or are you convinced that the oh, no, I think those days are gone. That, that used to be a concern among the people on the inside, but uh, I don't think they're knocking anybody off for that anymore or uh, uh, doing drastic things to them. What do you think the intent of the uh, aliens is? Is it hostile or peaceful? No, no, no. It, it's uh, not hostile. It's pretty obvious that if it were hostile, we'd have been gone by now. <laughs> really? I mean, what... I... <laughs> we could have been. Wow. We, I... had no, we had no defense, if that's what their real intent was. And what are we talking... What do they look like? Are we talking, like, you know, the traditional well, you, sort of... you've seen some of the pictures, uh, 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 the pictures that I know of. Some of them are... are uh, these little little people with strange that look strange to us, as far as I know from my from my uh, contacts that have had contact, uh, that looks that's pretty accurate. Wow! Do you think other people who were involved in the moon landings know about this? Some of them do, but again, it's like other people. If you're interested enough to dig into it and want to know about it, you can know about it. Because, uh, man, listen, I, I, don't want, I know you're a busy guy and I know there's other people who need to... Yeah, this phone, that, uh, this, not leaving me alone with this other phone that's ringing all the time. And I'm by uh, myself here. I, 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 this has been w easily one of the most significant conversations of my life. Unbelievable. Uh, 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 just, I, I want to thank you for joining us. you man. And, uh, Dr. Let's first of all find out where you stand on the issues of, uh, of uh, UFOs. You were, you were sceptical when you first took the job. Are, are you still sceptical? I'm less sceptical than I was. Mm. I, I think, you know, looking at the sorts of interesting reports in these files, the, the ones from police officers, pilots, military personnel, the ones tracked on radar, um, you know, there's, there's material there that certainly makes me think twice. It's not all misidentifications of aircraft lights and weather balloons. Is there any one report that stands out as extraordinary or perhaps most convincing? 
One in the new files that I particularly like is a, a radar sighting where an object travelled um, 10 nautical miles in 12 seconds, about 3,500 miles an hour. Mm. And, and that's on a military radar. So, um, you know, it takes the evidence to a whole level over and above just eyewitness testimony. I mean, could that be explained away by something like ball mm. lightning? Would that show up on a, on a radar? It, it really shouldn't. I mean, the assessment given at the time, and, and in, of course science actually isn't quite sure about ball lightning, so that's almost explaining one mystery with another, but um, mm. the military radar operators said, well, you know, it looks like a real solid return. What about this case in, uh, in Suffolk at the, at the US military airbase, which people talk about as being Britain's Roswell? Yes, Rendlesham Forest from December 1980. There are a few new papers on this in the files. This was extraordinary because a UFO landed and was seen by dozens of military witnesses and critically they took a Geiger counter to the landing site um, after this thing had gone and uh, the radiation levels that they um, discovered the MOD's defense intelligence staff said that they seemed significantly higher than background Mm. I'm also intrigued that some of these uh, unidentified flying objects could be spying missions by other countries. Well, that's one, one possible thought. And, and of course, you know, that's how we get into the whole UFO business, concern about uh, intrusion into right. our airspace. I'm being very cynical for a moment. I, I mean, am I uh, the only one that thinks it odd that a lot of these reports started to come in after the release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind? <laughs> well, that was certainly point. quite a year, but I think it, it may have played a part, but I think what it did is it raised awareness about the issue and maybe encouraged people who'd had sightings who might otherwise have uh, stayed silent to come forward. I don't think it necessarily generated the sightings itself. I'm sure you get all... Uh, kinds of observations coming in and all kinds of sightings. Is there anyone that's been particularly bizarre and how do you separate, how do you decide which one to put down in your files? It's, um, it depends on the quality of the information and the, the witness, but the sorts of things that I looked for were, um, is there some piece of evidence that, that um, means that you've got more than just somebody's word, a photo or a video that the MOD's technical uh, specialists can look at, uh, radar returns, things one, like that. One final question. All right, there are a lot of crackpots out there. <laughs> That's what you were alluded, yeah, alluding to. Some of them yes. are, are, are complete nutters. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of these unidentified flying objects could be man-made. We talked about about possibil the possibility of spying, spying aircraft. Spying missions, yeah. yeah. Uh, I suppose they could have come from elsewhere in the universe. What, what do you think? Are we alone? Um, I'm convinced there's life out there. As to whether any of it's coming down here, the politicians answer, I can't rule it out. And now to our story. Major Donald Kehoe is the director of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. As head of this private group interested in flying saucers, he has repeatedly attacked the United States Air Force and others for claiming that flying saucers are apparently flights of fancy and not flights by Martians or men from the moon. Independent surveys show that millions of Americans do share his belief in these celestial saucers. Major Kehoe, first of all, let me ask you this. Most people in the United States, in spite of the fact that I say that millions do believe, I think you will agree that most people in the United States don't believe in flying saucers from outer space. They probably hold the view of columnist Bob Considine, who wrote that flying saucers are products of, for the most part, quote, pranksters, halfwits, cranks, publicity hounds, fanatics in general, and screwballs, end quote. How do you feel about Mr. Considine's charge? Well, I know where he got the story. He got it from Colonel Watson out at the Air Technical Intelligence Center in Dayton. In fact, the colonel went even a little farther, and he said behind every sighting was an idiot, a crackpot, a religious fanatic. That included a lot of high-ranking Air Force pilots, incidentally, mm -hmm. and many airline captains, people who were qualified to see these things. Yes. But he's just following out an Air Force policy. Well, now, you're not suggesting that Bob Considine is in the pay of the Air Force. He's an no, independent I mean man with a considerable reputation. I mean the colonel. No, I have oh, every oh. respect for Bob Considine. In spite of the fact that he <clears throat> suggests that pranks, pranksters, half-wits, and screwballs are responsible for the stories about flying saucers. Well, I wish I could show him uh, any time a list of about 800 witnesses, some of the big names in aviation, including up to the rank of colonel in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. 
They're still flying and they're still carrying passengers. They've never been grounded. They're still guiding airliners in, the radar men are, night after night in bad weather. If they're screwballs and incompetence, why are they still on the job? Major Kehoe, where do you think flying saucers are coming from? I don't know. The, there is an indication that they could be using Mars as a base. I don't mean they originate there, but every time Mars has approached us in the last 10 years, there's been a noticeable increase in, in saucer sightings. Mm -hmm. And that's been mentioned officially. In fact, the Canadian official project, uh, on the basis of that, set up an observation station in Canada. You say the Canadian official project. Uh, what, what do you mean by the official? There was an official project called Project Magnet. And they set up an observatory at Shirley Bay mm -hmm. to try to track these things. And uh, What that, happened to the official project? You say there was a project. Yes, they, they ran for about a year, and they had one sighting uh, on a gravimeter, which indicated that something, a very large object, had flown over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, they finally decided they were spending a little too much money on it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly they wouldn't have thought that they were spending too much money on it if they believed that that kind of phenomena existed. A lot of people on the project are still working up there on their own time, and uh, certain government officials have still uh, kept the lid on their reports in Canada, just as they do down here. What is your theory? In other words, you suggest that they come from Mars or from other planets, from uh, other solar systems, possibly, throughout the universe. Is that correct? Yes, and there are a lot of scientists who said the same thing. What is your theory as to the kind of people who fly these, or the kind of beings who, who fly these saucers? Well, that's speculation. Willie Lay said recently they'd be just like the man next door, the invaders from space, and his reasons may be good. But most of the uh, top scientists have said that the odds are that uh, beings from other worlds would not be like us. Some of them would be. Uh, Dr. Harlow Shapley, for instance, said that there probably were at least 100 million inhabited planets in the universe. And uh, Menzel, who doesn't believe in saucers at all, says that he goes that high or even higher. And among those, by they must be, by the law of averages, a certain number of planets that would be like the Earth. Mm -hmm. And if evolution started at the same time, why, you might have the same type of being. What do you think of the intentions of these people, for lack of a better name, of these people and who are in these flying saucers? Well, there's been no evidence of any hostility. Uh, during the last uh, ten years, what we call the modern phase, there have been sightings before then. There have been some accidents, Air Force pilots chasing these things. Captain Mantell was killed chasing one in 48, and uh, two pilots disappeared chasing one in 53 over Lake Superior. But uh, I think those were just accidents. Just accidents. Why don't they try to communicate with us? What's your theory about that? Well, I'll follow some of the uh, theories the Air Force people have said. Suggest they suggested to me back in 52 and 53, at which time... Uh, we were cooperating. Uh, we, I had a lot of very good friends in the Air Force at that time. The policy was to give out the information. They were about to tell the people everything they had. And the theory was then that perhaps these beings were so much different from us that uh, communication would be a very hard thing. They might not, for instance, have speech sounds like ours. Mm -hmm. That's one answer. Another thing, they might not be able to exist in our atmosphere. Uh, we're going to land on the moon, we'll have to wear space suits or else uh, build uh, air-conditioned buildings up there, air pressure. Uh, there could be lots of factors like that. Well, do you think they're down here when we do see them to look at us? I think that it's probably a long-range survey. A long-range survey. That's but, right. And yet no attempt, as far as we know in any case, of communication with us. There have been claims of uh, communication, but those, most of those have been by individuals. The Air Force has not uh, admitted that there's ever been one, mm -hmm. and I don't know, our committee hasn't found any cases that we would accept as absolutely verified. All right, now, let's go at it from another point of view, if I may, the Air Force point of view. They agree, undoubtedly, objects have been seen in the sky. But the Air Force has said time and time again, and this is a quote from Richard Horner, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Research and Development, all but a small percentage of these reports of unidentified flying objects have been definitely attributed to natural phenomena that are neither mysterious nor dire, end quote. Weather balloons, mirages, ordinary sky phenomena like meteors, uh, airplanes themselves. What about that? I'll answer that, but I'd like to make several points doing it. 
1947, the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Dayton, the top Air Force intelligence men and scientists under contract, sent a secret document to the commanding general of the Air Force saying that whatever these things were, they were real. In 1948, ATIC, the same group, mm -hmm. sent a top secret estimate to the commanding general, Hoyt Vandenberg, said these were interplanetary space. In 1952, there was an intelligence analysis of the maneuvers of these things, as seen by radar, triangulation, radar photo uh, photographs, and in 1953, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Air Force had a special panel of scientists meet at the Pentagon to tell them what to do. And after they got through, this group said, you don't have proof that these things exist, not scientific proof, but you have a very strong circumstantial case. We suggest you quadruple investigation, set up special observation posts, and in the meantime, release everything you've got to the American people. Now, you've got four documents there that, that they've been sitting on all this time. Now, that, and they have been spending a lot of money investigating flying saucers. If they don't exist, why the money? Why did the intelligence teams rush out every time there's a sighting? Now then, you have mentioned four documents that you claim exist. We've heard in the past that you have claimed that these documents existed. We've seen your literature in which you talk about the existence of those documents. So we spoke with the Air Technical Intelligence <coughs> Center at the Pentagon earlier this week, and this is what we were told officially by them. Three of the four documents Major Kehoe refers to simply do not exist. The fourth document does exist. You can have a copy of it, Mr. Wallace, and you can see that it doesn't say what Major Kehoe claims it says. We have a copy of it, and I quote to you from the copy. The Air Force document says just this. The panel recommends that the national security agencies take immediate steps to strip the UFOs of the special status they have been given and the aura of mystery they have unfortunately acquired. We suggest an integrated program designed to reassure the public of the total lack of evidence of inimical forces behind the phenomena. And again, as I point out, Secretary Horner says, it simply ain't so. Now why, <clears throat> the, point, the, the point really at issue here it would seem, Major Kehoe, is this. Why do you believe that the Air Force says that nothing is going on? Why do you believe that the, it's a fairly serious charge that I you know make. it is. You make the charge that the United States government is withholding from the people of the United States certain very important information. Why? What would their motive be for withholding that kind of information from us? Well, I'll answer that, but I would also like to show you some proof that they are withholding it. The reason that was given to me when they were working with me back in 52 and 53 was, first, that they were afraid of hysteria. Remember the Orson Welles show back, way years back, when he scared people into the hills with the idea of invading Martians? Then... Uh, they were also afraid that it would upset uh, organized religion. That was a smaller factor, but there was some fear of it. Later, they were afraid that these accidents, when interceptors had chased these things and had been lost or had crashed, might be considered a proof of hostility. Now, I would never have put my name on anything if it were a matter of personal opinion. I've talked to and read the reports of hundreds of pilots and radar men and guided missile trackers who've seen these things, and some of them are very important names. Uh, the Air Force says they have da this down to 1.9%, but you'll notice the word current in there. They mean we are currently explaining. Now, I have in my possession a copy of Special Report 14, which is their Bible on this. In the back, it has a table showing that 3,201 3, cases they examined, 19.5% were unsolved and they admit they still are unsolved. You add up what they've had since then, it makes over 12% of the reports, and those are mostly from the best possible sources. Well, now, wait just a second. I'll mm -hmm. use your figures. The Department of Defense released an official bulletin of, on November 5, 1957, saying that from June of 55 to June of, uh, of 57, a two-year period, just a fraction over 2% of all investigated unidentified flying objects had to be listed as unknown. 2%. So that's your 1.9. What was the period again? 55 to 57. The rest were determined to have been balloons, airplanes, hoaxes, and a category about 12% called insufficient information, which means that the report was so flimsy that there was simply nothing to check on. I must confess that they have 
They've certainly shown me no classified material, but they have opened their files quite willingly to us in our preparation for this program tonight. And they've given us very convincing evidence, Major Kehoe, that it is <coughs> largely, I shouldn't say largely, I'll say 99 and 44 one hundred percent, a hoax. Now, you mentioned a hoax? Well, l l uh, when I say a, a hoax... a lot of good pilots hoaxers, then. No, 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 not hoaxers. I, I thank you for correcting me. Not just a hoax, but, let's say, misinformation or sightings of objects which seem to be one thing but are, in fact, another. Uh, I'm glad that you corrected me about hoax, because it was by no means that much a hoax. But you mentioned a Dr. Donald Menzel, who's a professor of astrophysics mm -hmm. at Harvard before. Now, I think you will agree that he's one of the world's most distinguished astrophysicists. Is that not so? I think there are others who are equally capable but who do not agree with him. He is, one of the, he is one of the world's most distinguished astrophysicists, though I think we can't agree on that. In any case, he stresses, you see, that pilots are not expert observers, mm -hmm. that they, as well as others, can see flying saucers when it's only, to quote him, the wrapper off somebody's lunch blowing around in the air, end quote. Uh, but again, let's come back to the point the most important point, Major Kehoe, and that is why, why will the Air Force, why will the United States government withhold information from United States citizens? For what reason? Because they're treating them like children, the way they did with the H-bomb at first, and the way they were doing with, they've been doing with other things. Now, I'm not attacking the United States Air Force. I'm attacking a small group in there that has been persistently keeping this from the, from the public, just as they've kept other things. For a long time, you couldn't even mention the idea that we could be hit by missiles from submarines from the Gulf and from both coasts very easily. I knew that years and years ago and tried to get it out, and at the time was discouraged about it. Now, I'm, you mentioned these, this denial of these documents. Now, I'd like to tell you something that happened on the Armstrong Circle Theater. I had requested that those points be in the script, and I was discouraged from it at first by the writer. Then later, some of our board of governors insisted that we have those points included. So I said, either I don't go on or we have those in there. So I said, all right. So the script was completely rewritten. Now, those were in the script as it was first rehearsed. But when the second rehearsal came along, and the Air Force saw the mimeograph sheet, the Air Force representative, according to the Armstrong writer, said they would immediately deny it on the air, even though it meant denouncing their own former project chief. Now, the source for this, was Captain Edward Ruppelt, who was the head of Project Blue Book for two years. And at that time, he was considered good enough that he briefed President Truman on these things. Mm -hmm. He was the top man. Rank didn't mean anything. It's your experience that counted. All right. He says these things existed. He put it in the book, which was cleared by security and review in the Air Force. On December 5th, 1955, that was cleared. It's in his book. He's never been hauled in and court-martialed. Now, I have here, and if you allow your camera to come in on it, mm -hmm. this is a sheet from the script of the Armstrong Theater, which was deleted. This was crossed off, and I was told that I couldn't say it on the air. Mm -hmm. Now, that was censorship by intimidation. This can be matched up with the other sheets from the Armstrong Circle script, and any typewriter expert will show you. Well, I'm certain, certain that, I'm certain they that... They ordered it taken out. I'm certain that people believe you. The only thing is that the next morning, I distinctly remember reading a report by you, Major Keogh, to the effect that no censorship, no pressure of any kind can put no, it on you. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Walsh. That, I know that statement almost by heart. Yes. I said that CBS and the Armstrong uh, people were not to blame for cutting me off the air when I tried to mention the fact that a Senate committee was working on the secrecy angle. I never mentioned this that night to anyone, because I had promised that I wouldn't say anything about it on the air, that, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Armstrong people. It was taken out, and I will do this. I will ask the United States Air Force to have the Marine Corps put me on active duty for court-martial, if that is not the case. Major Keogh, I understand you have three new reports on file, which, in your opinion, you have them currently on file, and they're new reports. And these, in your opinion, would convince every person in this country that flying saucers are a fact. Is that correct? They should convince a lot of people because of the, the names involved. Tell us about them. I told your uh, interviewer in Washington that I couldn't mention the names because they were too high. One of them is a top scientist in this country whose name would be known to everybody. Well, why wouldn't he want his... Because he's afraid of the official ridicule. 
He's afraid of official ridicule? That's right. More afraid of official ridicule than of possibly uh, alerting the country to a serious You'd national danger? You'd be surprised how many people give us reports and they say, please keep my name confidential. Well, I'll give you one report which came to us. The name has to be left out. In 1951, a UFO circled the fleet in Korean waters. It circled it at high speed, and they launched several planes to try to get a close in on it. They got a radar lock on. That is, the radar was guiding the planes toward the object. Mm -hmm. This was picked up by radars on 14 naval vessels. This object circled about uh, over oh, half an hour or more, and then it took off at a speed way over in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. This report was certified, and uh, nine members of our Board of Governors saw it, signed it, and agreed that it, they had seen it, and agreed to the contents. Yeah. Uh, there is another report that just came in from four top missile designers or engineers at one of the big plants in this country. They saw an elliptically shaped object and two small round disc shaped objects flying with it over California November 11th, 1957 at a speed of at least 5,000 miles an hour. These men are well qualified to know what they see with broad daylight, not a cloud in the sky. There have been cases even where the Air Force has shot at these things. Now, if there's nothing there and they don't exist, uh, why do they shoot at them? You mentioned Mr. Horner. The day after Mr. Horner said that the Air Force was not concealing anything, a Captain Gregory Oldenburg, a public information officer at Langley Field, refused to let an ad be inserted in the Langley Base Flyer, their newspaper, which asked that anybody interested in UFOs please communicate and form a little group. He said, I must refuse to do this because this, the dissemination of information on UFOs is contrary to Air Force policy and Air Force regulation 200-2. And I have a copy of it here in case you want to see it. Well, Major Kehoe, I must say that the Air Force tells us they don't question your motives, but they do question the accuracy of a good deal of your information, and for that reason they say you ha have been, and were they to, in a sense, uh, throw open an invitation to all people who cite UFOs to get in touch with them once again. They get all kinds of cranks, hoaxers, and so forth, and you see they run down every one of these sightings, and it has cost them a tremendous amount of money to no avail over the past few years. That's what they told you. That is what they told me. Now, sir, in a moment I'd like to ask you this. In the past few years, millions of flying saucer enthusiasts have become excited about the stories of two men, George Adamski and Howard Menger. Both of them claim to have seen flying saucers. Mm -hmm. Menger claims to have been given a ride in one by some creatures from Venus. Adamski says he's chatted with a man from Venus in the California desert. I'd like to get your reaction to those stories, and we'll get Major Kehoe's reaction in just 60 seconds. All right, Major, about George Adamski and Howard Menger, both men claim to have talked with men from Venus. Menger claims that he's even taken a ride on a flying saucer. Do you believe them? No. You think they are hoaxers? We do not accept any reports of these so-called contactees without more evidence. We've asked them to submit their claims and take a lie detector test. We don't throw them out. We simply say we'll give you a fair chance. I think that's the least important part of the picture. The most important part is the weight of evidence from hundreds of competent people, and I'd like to name a few. Captain Richard Case, American Airlines. Captain C.S. Childs, Eastern Airlines. Captain T. Kravitz, TWA. Robert Dickus, TWA. Colonel Donald J. Blakesley, U.S. Air Force, a wing commander. Mm -hmm. I could go down the list. Uh, people who know what they're doing, and they're still on duty, they're still flying. Major Kehoe, what would you like to see done about flying saucers that is not currently being done? What steps would you like to see taken? I think the American people should write to their congressman and insist that open hearings be held by the Senate Committee on Permanent on the Permanent Committee on Government Operations, which has been looking into this for six months. An Air Force uh, spokesman told us this last week. He said members of the Sen of the Senate subcommittee have talked with us already, and they have shown no interest in conducting any hearings on this issue. I talked with the chief investigator within the last two weeks. I gave him a lot of information, and I gave him data on one case where an airliner was sent to chase one of these things, and, they, and the passengers kept in ignorance of it at that time. That involves two government agencies beside the Air Force, which has re refused to release the report. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this. If you were to get, if, they, if the committee were to get Rupert, Major Fournay, several colonels around that time, Major General Garland, who was on the project, 
It would be a big revelation because the Air Force is simply treating the American people like children. They don't trust them with the facts. You know, here's an interesting, I think, an interesting question, Major. The United States and Russia have started sending satellites into the sky, and we may be hitting the moon with a rocket <clears throat> soon, possibly Mars. You believe that creatures from outer space have space stations on Mars. What's going to happen when we start firing rockets at the moon or at Mars? That question's already been brought up. Uh, we expect to have a base on the moon within the next five years. Uh, it's possible that there is a base on there. I don't say there was any proof of it. Is I it possible we're going to start an interplanetary <laughs> war when we start sending our rockets to the moon and to Mars? In 1935, General Douglas MacArthur said the next war would be an interplanetary war and we'd have to unite against people from other planets. One last question, Major Kehoe. Have you ever seen a flying saucer? I've seen them tracked on radar, but I take the word of about 800 of the best witnesses in this country and abroad. But you yourself have never seen a flying saucer? I've just been a reporter and a careful one. Thank you very much, Major Donald Kehoe. As you've just heard, the flying saucer controversy is deadlocked in contradictory statements and interpretation of facts. As for Major Donald Kehoe himself, like most of us, he's never seen a flying saucer, which may just make him like a mystic who's never seen a ghost. But one must give him credit. He has much faith.